Hey, hey everyone, let's go ahead and take a look at our free response question, or our first free response question on our sample final. And, and just an FYI, this is going to wind up being a hypothesis test, and you will have one of those on your final. So let's read through this and see if we can look for clues in the wording to help us get through this. So it says 90 minutes are allowed for students to complete the multiple choice section of a national exam. A random sample of 28 students selected from the students at a large high school took a practice exam and the time in minutes that it took each student to complete the multiple choice section was recorded. The times are given below. So just in that phrasing that I read out loud, the first thing I noticed when I was reading is I saw a random sample of 28 students. So I'll keep that in mind. And then the other thing I heard was that they were recording the time for each of those students. So there's my variable in the problem, right? So I've identified my variable and because I'm seeing some units pop in, this is a numerical variable. So my variable in this problem is this time to complete this multiple choice exam and the units are in minutes. Because again, keep in mind, every time you have a numerical variable, there's gonna be some units on it. But what that's gonna help me realize is if I have a numerical variable, I'm gonna be a mean land. That means I'm gonna do a T hypothesis test. And I put over here like my degrees of freedom. Well, if I had what, 28 students, so I have 27 degrees of freedom. And the other thing I'm gonna keep in mind is I only ran this through one sample. All right, so let's go see what this, this last little piece of phrasing is asking us to do. It says, is there evidence at the 5% level of significance that the mean time to complete the multiple choice sections for students at this school is less than 76 minutes? So to me, there's a lot of buzzwords in there. So let me scooch this up just a bit. Anytime I hear, is there evidence? There's the clue. That is telling me run the hype test run my hypothesis test, that phrase, because that has to do with step 13 when we say we have significant evidence or we don't have significant evidence. I see my alpha level there at 5%, and then I see this other buzzword here. This is confirming what I thought. I see the word mean. All right, I thought I was in mean land, and that phrase actually confirms it. And then this right here, less than 76 minutes, that's going to be helping me um, with my alternate. Now, you have a couple of options here. When I typically do these hypothesis tests, after I read through this, if I'm in mean land, I, I can go ahead and I can put this stuff into my calculator, like into L1, and run a t-test on it. Now, before I do that, I probably at least want to get through step five just to confirm that I've met my assumptions so that I continue with this problem. But a lot of times I like to do the technology piece sooner rather than later, just because it'll help me in, uh, with my write-up. All right, but with that, let's let's start going through these these steps. Now, we do have 13 steps. We're going to write that or run that hypothesis test. The first one is to define a parameter. And so since I'm in mean land, I'm going to go with mu. This is going to be the true average time to complete the multiple choice section of this exam. So let me write that out. And you could have written true mean time. Average and mean are, are interchangeable. All right, so let's get our null and our alternate. Ho and ha kind of come together here. All right, so whatever letter you define in step one, and in our case it was a mu, that needs to show up in steps two and three. I'm going to erase my little highlighting, and let's, let's make that happen. So I will have mu here. The null always has the equal sign. Now, I, I see this number of 76, so I'm going to assume mu is 76 with the alternate where the burden of proof is, that we have seven, less than 76. Now, if you want to go a little further and you want to write minutes, feel free. All right. Oops, let me write the word minutes. Now, my alpha level is 5%. All right, and let's go through my assumptions. All right, so the first assumption we have, regardless of if you're in mean land or proportion land, is did I have a random sample or does it say somewhere in the problem that my sample represents my population? Because that, that's ultimately what we want. We want our sample to look like our population just on a smaller scale. So if I scroll back up here, I do remember the phrase random. So I'm going to head over here and write random sample. And I'm going to put a little check mark. 
that just communicates, hey, I did check that. The next thing I need to do is get normality. Now in mean land, there are three ways. I'm gonna write them over on the side here. So I could have that normality was stated. That's one of the easier ways to do it, right? I could have that my sample size is 30 or more, or I could make a graph. So let's go through and see which of these three options we're doing. All right, so if I look through the phrasing, nowhere in there, and let me use a red pen this time, nowhere in there did it say normality, right? There's nothing in here saying the distribution of completion times on this exam is normally distributed. And when I look at my sample size, it was only 28, so the central limit theorem isn't kicking in. So what I need to do is I need to graph this, and I tend to make a box plot and look for, as long as my box plot is roughly symmetric, without outliers, I continue. So what I'm gonna do, and I'll flip over to our calculator in just a moment, I'm gonna put these data into L1, I'm gonna make that box plot, but I'm also gonna run the t-test while I'm there, just so I can use all of that information as I move through my write-up. So I'm gonna pause this video here, switch over to my calculator, and then I'm gonna run, I'm gonna make a box plot, run a t-test, and come back here. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Okay, everyone, let's take a look. I preemptively put my data into my list. So let me go ahead and make that box plot. And I've got, it looks like here, I need to turn this plot on. Uh, I need to get down into the box plot. And I put L1 in, I put my variable in L1. I don't have a frequency list, so I need to switch this out from L2 back to the number one. And you can kind of see that the alpha is on. So let me hit my green alpha key, turn that off and put a one here. If I hadn't hit the alpha key, then when I hit this one button, it would have given me the letter Y, which I didn't want. So I've got that. Let me go ahead and hit zoom nine now. And there's my box plot. And it is roughly symmetric. There's no outlier, so I'm gonna be good to go. Now for me personally, I, I you could I, I do want you to write the graph on your on your write-up, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go run the T test now that I'm here. Because I like to run these tests sooner rather than later. It's gonna give me all of the information I need for um, finishing my assumptions in this case and all the stuff I'll need for steps 9, 10, 11, and 12. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this. I'm gonna do this t-test. I have data this time and it's over in L1 and I'll put that in a moment. But we had our, all, I'm sorry, not our alternate, our null was 76 minutes. My data is in L1, the frequency is one, and I actually had a less than alternate, so I'm gonna highlight this. Now again, you can hit calculate or draw. I'm gonna go ahead and hit calculate right now, and then I'm gonna keep that information in mind. So I'm gonna have that screenshot when I head back to my work. Um, but let me also just go here, and let's run the t-test again, and let's graph it this time, or let's draw it, I should say, so we get an idea for what step 12 will ultimately look like. All right, so let's take a look. I should get a nice little bell curve. It might take a moment. Okay, so I can see that I have a little bit on the left tail to graph, but that will help me with step 12. So again, for me, I like to just go ahead and run all of the technology first, or maybe not first. I mean, we did steps one through five, but I like to do it sooner rather than later. All right, I'm gonna flip back to my notepad and we're gonna finish this out. All right, see you in a bit. Okay, everyone, we're back. Let's continue on with this and you see I took screenshots from all of that calculator work and that's just going to help me as I go through my write-up. So we were we left off on assumptions and I do have a roughly symmetric box plot. Oops, let me change the pen color there with no outliers. So let me go ahead and just copy that onto my paper or my work. All right, so box plot is roughly symmetric with no outliers. And what that basically tells us is that our sampling distribution, we can assume it's approximately normal. So that's how we get normality. All right, the third assumption in mean land is to find your standard deviation. But again, because I ran that t-test, I have it right here. Actually, let me highlight it for you. All right, and you could get this from one of our stats just as easily. It's just with the t-test, they already gave it to you. So that's why I like to run that t-test early early on in the problem. So this is 10.772, and this would be minutes. Because every statistic has the same units as our variable, which we're dealing with minutes. So I'm through that. Now let's go ahead and do step six. So here I'm gonna be using the T distribution. If you wanna be real specific, oops, that's not how you spell distribution. 
You could actually say it's T sub 27. So your book likes to use this. They'll say T sub 27 because it's the T shape, but with 27 degrees of freedom. All right, step seven, we're going to go ahead and say we are doing a one sample mean T hypothesis test. And then for step eight, I'll put that right here. I do have 27 degrees of freedom. All right, n minus one. So with 28 students, 27 degrees of freedom. Oops, all right, so let's go and start in on all of this fun number calculation. So to get my test statistic in mean land, it's always your sample mean minus your hypothesized mean over that standard error. And in this case, if I think about, let me get my highlighter again, x bar, we can see it over here at 72.429, so 72.429, that was my sample mean. My hypothesized mean, if we go back to the null hypothesis, this was up here at 76 minutes. All right, let me unhighlight that, but here we go, minus 76. My standard deviation was 10.772, and my sample size was 28. And this begins step 10. And I know what that number is. Let me get a different highlighter color. We have our test statistic at negative 1.754. So let me write that out. All right, now for step 11, I need a p-value, which is a probability. It's a conditional probability, right? If the null was true, if the mean was really 76 minutes, what's the probability that just by chance we would get a sample mean that's for almost what let's say three and a half minutes below it well let's let's go see what would happen just by chance and if that's enough to reject the null so my p-value here this is going to be a probability now because my alternate was a less than i'm going to use a less than symbol in my probability statement i'm going to have t less than negative 1.754 and this would have been tcdf my low if i'm thinking about this and let me head to my graph right you can see where I shaded my low, and let me change pen colors here, is negative infinity, and my high is negative 1.754. So those are my low and my high in the interval that I shaded. So let me go write that in. So we will have negative 1899, and then I will go to negative 1.754, and I had 27 degrees of freedom. Now, I could crunch that number using TCDF, but keep in mind, and let me erase some of the, the notes I've made so far, we already have the p-value. It came out in the t-test. It's 0.045. Okay, great. And then I want to make my graph, but again, I already made the graph on the calculator. I'll just go ahead and I'll copy it. Let me get a nice little line there. I've got my T labeled, zero is under the peak, negative 1.754 is somewhere down here, and I need to go less than that, so I would wanna shade all of the area on the left tail. All right, and that matches my graph over here. All right, so now I'm ready to finish this out. So if you wanna decide whether you're gonna reject or fail to reject, you always wanna compare your p-value here to your alpha level. All right, so if we look here, it looks like my p-value is less than alpha. So because our p-value is less than alpha, we will reject H0. Okay, great. And because we're rejecting H0, we have sufficient evidence for the alternate. So let me write, we have sufficient evidence that and then let's look at what the alternate says so i'm going to scroll back up here and if i look at the alternate it says mu less than 76 right mu less than 76 so i have evidence that mu which is the true average time to complete the multiple cho multiple choice section of an exam is less than 76 minutes so i'm going to write that out we have sufficient evidence that the true average time to complete the multiple choice section. Okay, the true average time to complete the multiple choice section of an exam is less than 76 minutes. And there's my write-up. All right, 
right, let me go ahead and just shrink this a bit so we can see the whole thing at once. And just FYI, I'm gonna put a little blurb here. Because you rejected the null, there is a possibility of a type one error. Anytime you reject the null, you might make a type one error. And anytime you fail to reject, it could possibly be a type two. Keeping in mind, the only way to actually know would be to run the census, but that's, that's what we got. So I hope that helps. I'll see you soon. Take care, bye.